Hello, everyone. I am Susan Gerbeck, and I was an attendee at SciCon 2023 at the Flamingo Casino uh, Resort in October of 2023. What you are about to see are a bunch of clips. Um, I did not mean to record these. Um, I just simply pointed my iPhone at the screen. Sometimes I was able, I had a good shot to be able to see the people on the stage. Sometimes I just filmed the, the screen that was right in front of me. I did not really intend to do this. I am not a videographer. I do not make videos. This is not my jive, but I do love preserving memories. And this video will eventually be released by the Center for Inquiry in January 2024 or later. That's when they usually start releasing videos. So please subscribe for a much more um, complete video, um, better filmed, better audio um, with Center for Inquiry. But in the meantime, these are just clips that I recorded. I um, didn't have a selfie stick or anything or tripod with me. This is just my iPhone. I have not edited these clips. So as my arm got tired of pointing at the screen, you're going to find some jiggling. Or if they said something that made me laugh, the camera is going to move. I'm not editing it. I'm just putting it out there just raw. This is for you guys to see what PsyCon is like. Um, enjoy the... Um, the look at it from a viewpoint of somebody like myself who was standing or sitting on the side of the of the room what you're going to see um is happening on this is happening at from 7 to 7 7 to 8 30 it is happening on october 27th 2023 it is called In Conversation with Bill Nye and Richard Dawkins, Presentation of the Richard Dawkins Award. And, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't know what I was to expect. I've, I've met both of these men and been at conferences with them and spoken at conferences with them many times. And Bill Nye is just so charming to... Um, you just never know what he's going to say. So I tried to film a clip and I said, oh, that's really good. And then I'd say to myself, my arm is really getting tired. I hope he hurries up and finishes. And then he'd say something else. So I clip it, you know, I'd end the clip and then start it up again, the camera again, hoping that my arm wouldn't, wouldn't grow numb. And he just kept going. And you'll notice that Bill Nye says often, back to you. He does that it's really funny so i don't even remember what i got i'm not watching these before i put them out so if there's nonsense in there or who knows what just bear with me if i waited until the video was perfect the video would not be going out so i hope you enjoy i hope you attend psychons in the future um, you can check out a lot of other videos on the center for inquiries um, YouTube channel. If you want to leave comments um, in my video, I'm happy to answer all the questions I possibly can. But this is just to give you an idea of what the conference was like. Hopefully it'll entice you to want to come to future PsyCons. They're held at the last week, usually the last week of um, October of every year. And they're held in Las Vegas, though they haven't always been, but they are have been the last few years and they probably will be going forward. You can find out all the information about PsyCon and this Richard Dawkins Award. And I hope you really enjoy. Um, Anti-climax, I suppose. No, well, climax, really. Instead, instead, instead of the, the, the white wine looking at the, the, at the sunset, this magnificent outburst. <laughs> Anyway, the end is nice, is a, is a great plan, pun, it actually works, because the message of terminal catastrophe is so disturbing, it isn't even trying to be funny, it's deadly earnest. But characteristically, Bill uses apocalyptic pessimism as a vehicle to educate us in science. Past winners of this award include Neil deGrasse Tyson, Cosmos's co-creator Androne, Penn and Teller, Stephen Fry, Stephen Pinker, 
Tim Minchin, and many other illustrious scientists, thinkers, and entertainers. It's given to, quote, a distinguished individual from the worlds of science, scholarship, education, or entertainment, who publicly proclaims the values of secularism and rationalism, upholding scientific truth wherever it may lead. No one exemplifies this commitment better than Bill Nye. As he has said, science is the best idea humans ever had. And it's my view that giving Bill this award is one of the best ideas the Centre for Inquiry for has had. Somebody asked him once if it would be a good idea for scientists to run the country. He said, no, we need politicians with empathy, negotiating skills, and the charisma to carry the country with them. Well, yes, we do. But if such politicians were scientifically educated rather than lawyers, <laughs> How could that not be an improvement? <laughs> if they were literate in all the sciences, not just narrow specialists, if they were steeped in the sort of critical thinking that this conference is all about, isn't it bloody obvious the world would be a better place? <laughs> if their science gave them a realistically pessimistic vision of the serious problems that lie ahead, coupled with an equally clear, optimistic, positive vision of how to solve them, yes. The more I think about it, the more obvious it becomes. Why not? Bill Nye for president! Yeah. It's my honour to give you this award. Um, 2023 Richard Dawkins Award to Bill Nye for exceptional service in the fight for reason and science. And on the back is a quote from Carl Sagan. Our passion for learning is our tool for survival. with God Delusion. Thank you. I've given it to many people in the hope that they join our merry band and leave their miserable, uh, unhappy bands. Uh, and, uh, but the one that really got me was The Ancestor's Tale. And uh, I just got to tell you, so, uh, that book was extremely influential. And, you know, as a mechanical engineer, naturally, I have very clear and a thorough understanding of evolution. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, got very interested in the formal, uh, the formal uh, description of evolution and this whole idea that really came to me uh, when I started attending skeptics meetings in Seattle, this idea of claims that can be tested and, uh, and uh, how we, know the world and so you have been a tremendous influence on me and to get this award named for you means uh, more than I can readily say so thank you very much now, <laughs> I, uh, I was struck by your remark when you said pessimism and optimism and balance now look everybody we are living at an extraordinary time. You know, if you like to worry about things, this is great. <laughs> but you have to be optimistic. If you're not optimistic, you're not gonna get anything done. Mm -hmm. If you go into, I don't know if you guys, I know you're all skeptics, hard nerds, but there's a baseball game going on in the next week or two. And those teams are optimistic. They think they're gonna win the game. If they don't, they'll lose for crying out loud. So yes, this is a critical time in human history. One might argue the most critical time since there were just a few thousand of us in uh, the Savannah in Africa. I mean, we have a chance to uh, just 
tremendously lower the quality of life for billions of us if we're not careful. On the other hand, working together with the process of science, we can celebrate the PB and J, the passion, beauty, and joy, <laughs> and the JOD, the joy of discovery. And we can, my friends, change the world. So thank you. Thank you. The policies which science tells is a political problem. How are we going to solve it? Well, we're going to have this conference. <laughs> and then, you know, if each of us tells two other people, and they tell two other people, then pretty soon, you know, by the time we get to 2 to the 11th, we'll have the whole place. But there's much in that, there's much in that, everybody. Uh, what we think of as critical thinking and uh, what, and when I was in school, it may have been called logic or logical reasoning is a really important idea. And you mentioned politicians. I claim that, now look, I'm from the States. I'm from the US. I grew up here. I don't know any better. But I, tr I have traveled the world a little bit. And say what you will, the US is the most influential uh, culture. I mean, you know, there's Disneyland everywhere. Uh, but along that line, I claim the guys who wrote the Constitution and whoever it was that influenced them uh, were nerds. And they were trying to come up with a system, a system of government, that had built into it change. You know, I just think how those conversations would have gone in colloquial terms <laughs> with, you know, some of their British buddies. Uh, so you're going to have a king, right? No, no, we're not going to have a king. Dude, come on. <laughs> you're going to have a queen. No, we're not going to have a queen. No, no. Well, who's going to be, well, we're going to change it every four years. No. <laughs> that would never work. And maybe they're right. We change it every eight years normally. Uh, but this idea is terrific. And, you know, through the Planetary Society, I now go to the offices of members of the U.S. Congress and Senate. And it was just a month ago, uh, third week of September, we had our day of action. And we were on Capitol Hill, 105 people who pay their own way to Washington, D.C. Uh, to meet with their members of Congress. And so I was in, one day, I was in Chuck Schumer's office and Ted Cruz's office. And these guys don't get along about anything but they do get along about the importance of space exploration and funding NASA and so on. So I believe, perhaps in kooky fashion, delusional fashion, that we can find common ground and move forward. And this common ground is gonna be through science. And you can meet several members of Congress. I've met, I had 21 meetings in two days. But you can meet members of Congress and their staffs, staff people, who are unaware of Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution. And by the way, the US Constitution is now available in paperback. <laughs> uh, Article 1, oh, Article 1, Section 8 is kind of the miscellany, other jobs of Congress. Article 7, I mean, uh, uh, Article 1, Section 7 is about the Postal Service. So anybody who tells you we're going to close the post office is not paying attention. Are you high? We're not closing the post office. We're crying out loud. But Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 refers to the job of Congress is to promote the progress of science and useful arts. It's in the Constitution. And to me, useful arts refers to 18th century description of engineering using science to make stuff, bridges, buildings, uh, plows, what have you, and of course weapons. But uh, people are unaware of that. And the word science was extant in 1786 uh, and 91 when they finally signed it all. But the word scientist apparently didn't come along until about 1830. It's really remarkable. So uh, it, is, uh, it is an honor and, and uh, a remarkable thing to be living on Earth right now. This is the most exciting time in human history. 
as messed up as things seems to be, seem to be, we are making more discoveries more rapidly, we are engaging more people, we are raising the standard of living of more women and girls than ever in history. And so let's go, people. It's true. Let's get it done. He's got name checked quite a bit there, uh, as well he should, but he mentioned solar wind. The, the thing that propels the solar cell is just photons. The solar wind is uh, barely a hundredth of the impulse or momentum of, of sunlight at, at that at, when you're in space. So you guys, it was apparently Johann, Johannes Kepler who observed the comet that later came to be called Comet Holly and noticed that the tail always points away from the sun, whether you're coming in or going out. And he, he reasoned that there's something about sunlight that one day humankind would sail sunbeams the way we sail winds on the sea. This is really quite an insight. And so Carl Sagan and these guys, Bruce Murray, who was head of the Jet Propulsion Lab at, during the Viking and Voyager missions, he's a very influential guy. And Lou Friedman, who's still around, he's an orbital mechanics guy at the Jet Propulsion Lab tried to get a solar sail mission to catch up with Comet Holly, the very same comet, and uh, it got canceled. Remember the handshake in space, where the Soviet space program and the US space program had an astronaut and a cosmonaut shake hands? And that way, there's never be any more conflict between these two, uh, mm -hmm. these two governments or uh, value systems. I'm kidding, uh, sort of, but the idea was really good. Anyway, the, the solar sail, got set aside, and uh, Carl Sagan did not live to see the solar sails fly. We flew in 2014 and then 2019, and the thing was a success. Is there anybody here who's not a member of the Planetary Society? I mean, you can be honest. I'm kidding, of course you should all join at Planetary Dollar. I see a t-shirt here in the front row. So we, uh, we advanced space science and exploration, and that mission, a mission is space talk for rocket ship thing. Uh, uh, was really inspirational, and so I really, I really appreciate that you appreciate it because we built it. We have fifty thousand members around the world. It's actually out there. You've actually done it. We did it. Yeah. And we got it to deploy. You know, the other solar sails have had difficulty deploying. You know, get it, you guys. Uh, if you spend some time studying James Webb or JWST, it really, just getting the thing to work, uh, unfold, is quite a deal in itself. Nothing, space, it just doesn't work the way you'd think it would in when the gravity field, where you can walk up to it with something like WD-40 and help it. <laughs> it's really a subtle thing. And so we got it to deploy, and we proved that we could increase orbital energy and uh, we took these astonishing pictures. If you guys go to our website, and uh, we got these cameras from an organ a company called the Aerospace Com Corporation. Where did you get the idea for the name? That's brilliant. <laughs> anyway, they're at the end of the runway there at LAX, and they gave us some cameras. They make a lot of the flood cameras, <laughs> and uh, ones for use for situational awareness, and uh, the pictures really are spectacular. Uh, Everybody who flies in space is affected. Everybody says you get the overview effect and you see how fragile the Earth is. And so I believe those pictures help us appreciate that point of view. That how, how far does it? How far does the does the effect work? How far from the sun? Can well, there's a lot has been written about this. So, uh, excellent question. So JAXA, Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. There's a penchant in. Uh, Japanese culture to use romaji, you know, Roman letters. <laughs> so JAXA uh, has this mission going out to Jupiter, a solar sail mission. And you get much past Jupiter, it gets, it gets less and less practical. But people have talked a lot, you know, visionaries, about building a sail that doesn't work with uh, visible light photons, but with uh, photons and other wavelengths and the solar wind, the stream particles, and, be a big wire mesh like like the shielding on a microwave oven, and you'd go way out. It's acceler accelerating all the time. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> night and day, but you're in space, there's no night. And, uh, and the other uh, thing about solar sails, 
and really right now is the only technology anybody's thought of that you could use to go to another star system, yeah. which is not necessarily practical, but uh, a remarkable thing to think about. And the trick would be to put have, have a laser. I guess you take a half dozen Hoover dams and you build a laser system to push it. But some calculations indicate it would take more than all the electricity produced on Earth for five seconds or something. And then people talk about putting a laser system on the far side of the moon and, uh, and give it, get it solar panels and give it a push. But this is extraordinary. And if you are at Alpha Centauri, on Alpha Centauri uh, 4, or wherever that planet is, and these guys have sent you a spacecraft going at some appreciable fraction of the speed of light, and it hits something, <laughs> you would be really unpopular in other civilization. And so, you know, the old in physics, you know, you can stop a locomotive with a mosquito if it's going fast enough. And so uh, people talk about a solar sail that would barely be a square centimeter and send it all the way, you know, with a laser. Okay, it's visionary, but we prove that you can do it. There's some missions that solar sail is just ideal. And uh, we talked about earlier uh, when, you know, there's, when you're a kid, there's two things, space and dinosaurs. <laughs> well, when I was in second grade, uh, my teacher, Mrs. McGonagall, was compelled to read from a book. The reason the ancient dinosaurs went extinct is they had small brains. And so the mammals took all the dinosaur food. And I remember, I was a little kid, but I remember she, her heart wasn't in it. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, I've done this, but if you're a Tyrannosaurus or a Tyrannosaurus, <laughs> and you come on a rabbit, you know, I mean, yeah. that's it. Yeah. And so she knew that there was something wrong with that. But in my lifetime, you guys, we found the convergence of of space and dinosaurs, where the asteroid is almost certainly would finish them off and it is the only preventable natural disaster. And so what we would do with a civilized civilization is have a solar sail spacecraft about 7.7 AU run the orbit of Venus that would look out and look for asteroids and in a very diligent way. We're gonna have near Earth object surveyor, near Earth surveyor, and that's gonna be a great mission, but we take it up a few notches. And looking for an asteroid, as the hilarious joke goes, is like looking for a charcoal briquette in the dark. It's very difficult to see in visible light. But in the infrared, they glow at a whopping 200 Kelvin, you know, uh, quite a bit below freezing. And you would find these things, and then you could, a society could plan 20, 30 years to give them a nudge. And I was in, uh, I was in, at APL, you guys know APL, Applied Physics Lab? Mm -hmm. So JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, is in Pasadena. Applied Physics Lab is in, Mar in Maryland. Uh, and if you work at JPL, your paycheck comes from Caltech. If you work at APL, your paycheck comes from Johns Hopkins University. And um, uh, you don't hear that much about APL because they also make a bunch of spy stuff. <laughs> but they did the Pluto mission, New Horizons, and they did DART, Double Asteroid Redirection Test. And I was there, man, and it was cool. You know, they ran the spacecraft right into another, except in space, there's no noise. And, uh, and uh, they gave the thing a nudge, and it was really cool, because the, the extraordinary thing about that mission, technically, was you couldn't send it uh, guidance information from here. The time, the delay, was even at the speed of light, is too long. So it had to find its way in, and it did. The longest journey starts with a single step. We can deflect an asteroid. Don't you don't want to send Bruce Willis? That's not the way to go, because you might break it up, and it would be even worse. You have a, like buckshot instead of a single projectile. I, I was pleased to meet uh, the astronaut Rusty Schweikert. He's very. Oh God, he's the guy. Yeah. And um, that was quite a revelation to me. And he explained that we only have to change the velocity by a few meters per second. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's, it's rocket science. You know, this is 
This is, so let's just do this thought experiment, people in fifth grade. You know how much the astronauts weigh and their uh, food source, formerly Tang. And uh, that could be an older reference lost on some of the younger listeners. And, uh, and you know uh, how much the rocket itself weighs. And every moment that goes by, after you light the engine, every moment that goes by, the rocket weighs less. Right, every moment. So how much fuel do you start with? It's a heck of a problem. And so Newton and Leibniz figured this out and then in calculus, that's quite a thing. And then uh, and two different guys on different parts of Earth figured out the rocket equation at about the same time. It's really a remarkable thing. But along that line, a rusty Schleicher story, if I may, it's not very long. If you go to uh, the Chabot Space and Science Center, which is now a NASA facility in, uh, up the hill from Oakland, California, they have a bunch of space artifacts and they have a real Apollo landing simulator, lunar excursion module simulator. And a guy I went to college with, Dan Miller, He's very successful, he's an electrical engineer, and he came up with Ask Jeeves. Do you remember Ask Jeeves? No, and he sold it as ask.com, he does, he does very well. But he was also, obviously, the president of the uh, American Pinball Association. Woohoo! Obviously, and he has played a lot of pinball. And he's a guy, electrical engineer of a certain age, and he loves the relays and all the chunk, 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 you know, the uh, bumpers and stuff, and he's played, the Apollo astronaut, the Apollo lunar lander game many, many times. Anyway, he has trouble. You can set it to different difficulties. There's a lever of, of toggle. And he has a lot of trouble then. Rusty Schweiger walked up to that machine at this astronaut autograph night, boom, put it right down. <laughs> it's just muscle memory. He must have played that thing thousands of times as an astronaut. It's very cool. I just went, wow, these guys are real deal. Yeah. There, there are some scientists who think that it's a waste of money to send people into space, and I was impressed by your objection to that. I mean, you're one of the few people I've heard who actually justifies sending people into space. Well, let's talk about a couple things. Uh, the, everybody appreciate that landing on the moon, and I was there, I, I mean, by that I was here. <laughs> but I was alive and I was watching it, and it was amazing and all that. Just everybody. It, what, we learned more about the age of the Earth, we learned about the formation of the moon. There's even a type of mineral uh, named after uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the base where it's landed. <laughs> Dude, tranquility -ite. yeah, right, is even uh, mineral. Uh, that's good, but it was the Cold War, everybody. That's why people went to the moon. It was a race, and everybody sort of figured, everybody in the world came to understand that whoever got a person there first would be the winner somehow. And sure enough, a few years later, the Soviet Union went out of business. I mean, and, and, <laughs> no, I mean it, seriously, you guys, they, they uh, it was our way of doing things, or U.S. way of doing things, or Western way of doing things versus this thing, this other technique. And so uh, that was great, but knocked on from that are all these amazing discoveries and this tradition of space exploration and all that. But then from a practical standpoint, uh, it has been estimated that what our best Martian rovers do, you know, we have uh, spirit, we have as far as rovers, we have Sojourner, Spirit, Curiosity, uh, sort of a Spirit Opportunity, or Curiosity and now Perseverance, all up there. They're worth, by the way, all together, they're worth about four billion US, and they're not even locked. <laughs> you just walk up to them, you know, you think they would have thought of that. But what our best, that's a solid joke. <laughs> what our best rovers do, driven by our rest, best rover drivers, directed by our best rover geology science people, what they can do in a week, a human geologist, dressed properly, uh, could do in about five minutes. Some people say a minute. 
because the geologist knows what to look for, picks up the rock, hits it, this and that. And then there's a lot of effort being put in to bring samples back from Mars. And you know, you can buy Mars rocks. That, they're rare, but they're not that rare. I mean, you, there are people who collect them and the place to get them apparently is Antarctica. You go on the ice, you know, when a rock is found on the ice, there's nobody going down there, you know, throwing them. They came from space, but the kind of rock that can survive an impact on Mars, thrown into space, woo -woo -woo -woo, once again, and lands on Earth, can get through the Earth's atmosphere and make it to the ice in Antarctica, is a different type of rock than you would find in a river delta that used to be very wet, a mud rock, as they call it. So we want to bring back mud, mud rocks, extraordinary expense, a lot of messing around. But if a human geologist were there, he'd get it done. You know, he'd look at it. And the dream, you guys, what keeps me in the game is I want to find evidence of life or stranger still something alive on another world and if we could find fossilized pond scum stromatolites of mars i mean it would change history everybody Absolutely. everybody would feel differently about being alive yeah. on earth and that is a worthy quest and if you go up to people on the street or here <laughs> and say indoors where it's always cold uh, <laughs> You could say, how much is the, is the budget of NASA in the States? And people would say, oh, it's 10%. No, it's 0.4%. And the discoveries that are made change the world. And, and I remind everybody, people talk about, well, commercial, commercial space companies are doing everything that NASA did. No, I mean, building rockets is different. There's no business case for driving around on Mars looking for evidence of water flow and then ultimately life. This would be, this is an extraordinary thing. And Mars is but one example. You know, uh, Europa has twice as much ocean water as Earth. It's a moon of Jupiter. Discovered by the sea, the ocean there was discovered by a woman, by the way, Margaret Kilbelson. Kilbelson. And then, you guys, have you heard about phosphine gas in the atmosphere of Venus? I mean, what was it? What the fact? Is that the name of the book? I mean, you guys, the, the main way we find this gas on Earth is uh, given off by microbes. And the Venusian surface, by the way, you know, the adjective for having the characteristics of and pertaining to Venus is Venusian. Originally, it was venereal. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know, it's not my idea. Anyway, uh, the surface of Venus is unbelievably hostile. I mean, it's just no way. It, uh, it's, you know, melts lead and all that. Nine, 90 times the atmospheric pressure. The atmosphere is so thick. Thank you. <laughs> it's so thick that it has tidal effects. It's like having an ocean of thick air. Uh, but the atmosphere, is quite temperate, it's like 30 Celsius or something. Are there Venusian aeroplankton? These would be creatures that live in the atmosphere of Venus. Whoa, dude! <laughs> and so that is an extraordinary thing worth investigating. And then Enceladus, the moon of Saturn that seems to have water and carbon dioxide shooting off into space all the time. These are extraordinary things. And if NASA's 0.4% of the federal budget, that planetary science budget is barely 9% of that 0.4%. And so it's an extraordinary thing to invest in. And um, with that said, we're heeding that Carl Sagan talked continually about comparative planetology. When you compare the climates of Mars to Earth to Venus, you see that we are changing things very fast and it's time to get to work. Time to get to work, Richard. But let's talk about um, energy now then. Um, coal, I know, is a great bugbear of yours for a very good reason. And there's, in, in one of the books I've just read, there's a lot about um, re renewable energy and fascinating ideas about albedo of the Earth and, and um, 
using tidal power, wind power available. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer, and uh, thank you, mechanical engineer. You can tell, you know, my pants don't reach the... the uh, <laughs> oh, you're an engineer. <laughs> Hey, can you fix the blender? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hold the plug in the wall firmly. And then put the blender under some cold running water. It's really funny. So uh, anyway, when you have a hammer, every problem is a nail. All right, so when you're a mechanical engineer, you look at the world. What we need are wind turbines, cool wind turbines. You know, you guys, does anybody live around wind turbines? Keep in mind, they're... I, my first job out of school was at, on 747s at Boeing. Don't worry, it's very well supervised. <laughs> on 747. But the modern wind turbines, turbines are wider across than that airplane, wider across than a 777. And uh, the tip speed is really fast. And uh, they're huge machines that can produce a lot of electricity. And so if it has been argued that if you had about four times as much wind and solar and energy storage as we have now, right around four times, we could power North America uh, renewably. It's an extraordinary claim, but uh, it just shows you that as the price of renewable electricity, wind and solar principle, principally, and you mentioned geothermal, I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, tidal energy. If we did all that, uh, we could greatly lower our carbon footprint very, very quickly. But getting people on board with it is a, a difficult problem. And some people don't want the wind turbines. But the things that go wrong with wind turbines are so much less catastrophic than things that go wrong with uh, uh, oil wells and methane leakage. And of course, everybody's bugaboo nuclear energy. Uh, so, uh, the promise of these things is fantastic, but what we need is to get everybody on board, uh, by that I mean voters and taxpayers engaged so that we embrace these technologies as quickly as possible. Uh, with that said, you mentioned this albedo thing. I, uh, you guys, I am very skeptical of this idea of putting sulfur high in the atmosphere to reflect sunlight into space. But the people who are studying it, one guy is a mechanical engineer, uh, are doing it not because, not necessarily because uh, they're technocrat know-it-alls, but because people are really concerned that maybe this we're just gonna have to reflect sunlight like crazy or we're gonna be in huge trouble. And uh, you guys know the hockey stick graph. Mm -hmm. Michael Mann is a friend of mine. He's a friend of mine. He's a friend of mine. <laughs> anyway, his latest book uh, is there's not this fragile moment. He studies ancient. He studied ancient climates using all these so-called proxy methods of stromatolites, pond scum, uh, tree rings, and then the ice. The ice, you know, when you go to the ice cores and get ancient uh, water uh, and look at the neutrons and oxygen atoms, you can really determine the temperature of the sea surface and the temperature of the world in ancient times. <clears throat> now, using all that data, we're living at this extraordinary moment. And there is not, according to the latest computer modeling, there's not going to be this turning point where everything goes to hell all at once. Instead, it's just going to get worse and worse, hotter and hotter, bigger and bigger storms the Gulf Stream slowing down and down and down uh, over the next few decades. Unless we do something. And one of the cool ideas that I was really charmed, back, uh, charmed about, which I think you alluded to, you know, is making the wakes of large cargo ships bubbly. And they reflect sunlight into space. And there'd be the International Bubble Space Reflection Regulatory Agency. <laughs> And we would uh, control, manage the albedo of Earth with all these extraordinary methods, but also with the wakes of very, very large ships. It's a cool idea, but it would take 
so-called top-down management. People would have to believe that it was worth doing and then really pursue it. But I love, of course, I love ideas like that. But for engage, going, and people say to me, Bill, Nye, science guy, what can I do about climate change? And I always say two things. Talk about it. If we were talking about climate change, or we talk about all these other problems, we would be doing something. If we talked about climate change, we'd be talking about gun violence, which is an important issue, man, man. But if we were talking about it at that level, we would be doing something. And then the other thing I say, you guys, is vote. Mm -hmm. Vote. And if you don't want to vote, if you think your vote doesn't count, would you just shut up? <laughs> and let the rest of us who want to do something get it done. And, you know, I used to say, thank you, thank you. Richard, I used to say, I know you're, you're not a U.S. citizen, right? Way to go. Uh, but... Uh, I used to say the most important election in my lifetime was 2000, when uh, when uh, Bush the second beat Al Gore, and uh, Al Gore well, didn't Al Gore, <laughs> Al Gore won the election but did not become president. Because yeah. if he had become president, we would have done something. I mean, we would have done non-zero about climate change, and there's a chance, of course, we wouldn't have been invaded the wrong country and tried to kill the wrong guy. There's a lot about that. But uh, 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 this is a really important time. And, and uh, now I say to everybody, 2024 is the most important election in history. And I know there's some uh, Canadians here, even, woo, uh, woo! Uh, glorious and free. Uh, even if you're not in the United States, this election affects everybody in the world. So vote. And you can hate me, you can hate everything, you can be an everything hater person, but vote in this election and take the climate, the environment into account when you vote. Please. Picking yeah. about the electoral college. Oh, well, that would be great. You guys, so, I mean, it would be great to get to the electoral college, longest journey, single step. What we can do is get state legislatures to acknowledge, the, or rather uh, pass laws, to get all of their electoral college votes to go to the winner of the popular mm -hmm. vote. If we do that for a few elections, then eventually we can abandon the electoral college. But everybody, as long as the system is the way it is, you know, Mitch McConnell ain't letting go, okay? And, uh, and not, I don't blame, you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, they have four senators. California, which has more people than Canada, by a little bit, has two senators. I mean, so the appeal is play fair, you guys. Let's play fair. So-and-so won the popular vote, so let's have all your electoral college votes go to that. And it's going to take a few cycles to make changes. But, you know, it was proposed in 1970, almost. I was alive, almost, and the, uh, what I would like, while you guys are out there, uh, every few weeks, we're doing the Science Guy show, every few weeks somebody would send me their blues song about DNA, for example. Their, their own band has written a song about DNA. Great. Uh, I'll just say, and just tell you all, Writing the lyrics is not easy, but it's not that hard. It's the melody that sells songs when you're doing that. And what we need is a protest song. We need some big time rock guy, Conan Gray, Taylor Swift, to write a protest song. Because I was in middle school uh, at first, and then I was in high school when the Vietnam War was going on. And when I was 17, I had a very low draft number. And I was really anxious about going to Vietnam because it wasn't, both of my parents were veterans of World War II. My dad was a prisoner of war. My mom was one of the code girls uh, who broke the, she single-handed me. No, she <laughs> was a cryptographer. What'd you do during the war, mom? Can't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I never found out really what she did. My wife found out more about what she did than I did, and uh, uh, than I ever knew. And uh, uh, I was brought up with this tradition of service. If there's a big deal war, you go fight it. But the Vietnam War was different.
because nobody, people my age didn't think it was something we should be involved in. But then when I was 18, my draft number went way up. <laughs> but in the interim, and I didn't get drafted, but in the interim, the protests against the Vietnam War were enormous. I, I grew up in the city of Washington, D.C., in the city limits of Washington. You know how people from Michigan do this? I grew up in the city of Washington. And uh, there was one day you couldn't drive. All the streets were just covered with people. And sure enough, that protest ended the war. So we can do this, everybody. We can get enough people on board for climate change, for changing our political system to make it more fair. We can do this. And peaceful protests are part of part of the equation. Back to you. Not somebody who likes that stuff. You know, people. The reason our Congress and every country's uh, legislative bodies are made up of lawyers is because they like laws. They think it's cool writing uh, writing uh, policy. But we do have a problem right now where the people in Congress, this is like the best job they're ever going to have. And they're just throwing it around without quite understanding why they're there. Back to you. What about, um, talk about um, nuclear fusion as a, as a... As you know, I am, pun intended, all hot for nuclear fusion. <laughs> when I was, you know, in school, it was always 40 years away, 40 years away. Uh, you guys, I'm a can punch man, and if you want to get to me, if you want to make me feel bad about myself, Bill Nye, he's no scientist. He's an engineer. Hey, mechanical engineering is just classical physics. That's all it is, man. And I went into mechanical engineering because I think bicycles and airplanes are cool. That's my deal. Anyway, uh, uh, Fusion would be all particle physics. And the thing that's changed is now we have computers, artificial intelligence, that can adjust these magnetic fields fast enough to contain them. And the hilarious uh, turn of phrase is controlling a plasma. This is a gas that's so hot, all, how hot is it? It's so hot, all the electrons are dissociated from the atoms. And it behaves in a way that's not like the conventional three states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. They behave differently. And so containing them is like trying to contain jello with steam. And it's a very difficult problem. But now it looks like there's so many organizations, government organizations, private companies, and academ academic uh, organizations that are working on this, it looks like somebody's going to figure it out. And if, that, if we could do that, it would change the world. We would have limitless electricity. If you had limitless electricity, you could do the big bills, big three things, clean water, renewable, reliable electricity, the base load when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, and, um, and then access to the internet for everybody in the world. And the reason you want access to the internet is to provide education. And you can provide education you raise the standard of living of women and girls. And when you do that, everybody's life is better. You know the old saying, thank you. My mother said all the time, happy women and girls, happy life. And, but as much there's much in that. I, it's not my idea, but it's very well documented or proven. So let's go. I'm very excited about nuclear fusion. And the one that I'm hot for, although people have disabused me of it, is this company in California called TAE Industries. It used to be Tri Alpha Energy, using boron hydride gas, whatever that is. And you run that, boron has five protons and hydrogen has one. You run protons into it and you get, uh, Mr. Spock, you get, you get three helium nuclei. And that would be release all the heat and you capture it in conventional um, heat engine fashion, and you'd have a running turbine and you'd have electricity, it'd be very cool. And if it doesn't work, I still think it's worth investing in to see about this magnetic field, if we can manage magnetic fields. Insofar as you can find scientists who oppose evolution, 
I find engineers are the worst. Oh, I'll go for men. Yeah. No, uh, you know, as Neil deGrasse Tyson points out, if you're looking for a scientist who's a good atheist, that's not that hard. Finding an engineer that's an atheist is a lot harder. There's, you no, know, it's a different tradition of, of people who are uh, from industrial families that work in industry and have uh, and grow up in communities with a lot of uh, fundamentalism and so on. No, there's much in what you say. Yeah. yeah. I have applauded you for as a scientist with them because it makes the audience think that they are true scientists who are. Um, but I think you did the right thing. Um, wow, thank you. I the, thought you'd tell me it was the worst thing that ever happened. No, but I mean, <laughs> the, there is, I mean, the, the case that hand. Steve Gould was making, I think is a good one, um, but it's not too overwhelming. And I, so I think well, uh, here's the thing, you guys, about that debate. Is there anybody here who hasn't seen it, memorized it, watched it several times? <laughs> Everybody, I was advised by in conventional debate coaching fashion. Bill, be sure you go first. Go first. And kids, everybody, my friends, no. Uh, I love you all, but that's in a conventional debate. In this thing, my claim is my audience was not the debate coaches or the debate judges or the people in the audience in Petersburg, Kentucky. My audience was on the internet in the world. And so I won't say I largely ignored what Mr. Ham was saying, but I didn't address every one of his inane, just odd points over and over. Uh, instead, I presented conventional science-based uh, uh, arguments against his extraordinary, weird <laughs> worldview. The Earth is 6,000. Mr. Ham, there are trees that are 10,000 years old. Are you high? What is going on? Dude, dude, dude. And so uh, uh, that thing, that debate has had now officially in August 10 million views. And so, thank you. And so in the internet world of, uh, of media, it's estimated that when you have 10 million official views on YouTube, you have about four times that many unofficial views. So somebody's watching it and they're all not uh, young earth creationists. So I, I feel that the right people are watching it and I stand by it. One thing that happened that I did not anticipate, I'll admit, is the way they manipulated money I looked briefly into the laws of Kentucky and the way the funding of the Creation Museum, which is his earlier facility, it's still there, heavens, heavens pun intended, uh, in, uh, it's still there in Petersburg, Kentucky, and I didn't think that they would have the money. No matter how well this thing went, they'd have the money, but they had this, what I would call a financial trick with this cross, cross creek, institution, they moved money around in a way I didn't anticipate. But they also had a creationist governor and they had a tourism board that was all creationist. That was, that's a governor created tourism board and it's in Grant County and they gave all these crazy tax breaks to the businesses there. But they did eventually get nailed on, on um, having their employees sign on to being, uh, I walk in, I walk in faith with Jesus Christ or something, they, they couldn't pull that off. They couldn't get their employees having to sign that. And they do a lot of bad. They do a lot of bad, but the worst thing they do is their education or miseducation about climate change. I mean, it's all bad, but that's the one that really gets my goat, is this thoughtless, silly, inane climate change stuff. So if you watch my debate, I explain it. 6,000 winter sun cycles, I mean, uh, winter summer cycles, <laughs> over 4.5 billion years. Dude, no, this is not working out. You're crazy. You're just crazy. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, we'll see what happens. Stay tuned. Back, thank you for your support of that, Richard. Thank you.
Well, okay. Um, I mean, you, you get sits on a platform with them. They are somehow on equal terms. The way he put it was. Oh yeah, that's a problem. They they've won the moment you agree to appear with them. Let alone even if you wipe the floor with them. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And he would never come to a debate here, or in New York City, or some you know civilized place. Uh, uh, but uh, but I went into the lion's den to make to put that evidence yeah. on the internet. Yeah. That was why I did. Well, and well done. Congratulations. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and Jeannie, let me thank. Oh heavens, uh, let me thank Jeannie Scott and her colleagues. She was running the show. Uh, she gave me just. Spot on specific great advice, and I'm wearing my Planetary Society pin the way anybody would. But I was also wearing my NCSE pin, my uh, Center for Science Education pin, uh, because very proud to have done that. So thank you, shout out to you and her colleague. Well, let's talk a bit about science education. Um, how, do we, how do we get it wrong? How do we get it right? Science education. Well, everybody. Uh, about half of what we learn in, about science. For regular people, you learn what they call informally, and informal science education is a technical word. It means out of school, I and mean, that's an official legal or science education expression. And so we want, for me, uh, we wanted, I wanted to make informal science education uh, as accessible as possible. And so, I, you guys may have heard the story, but I'm of a certain age, and I was in the workforce, working at Boeing, and then at the shipyard. I worked at this company that made the premier oil slick skimming boat for a while, and uh, and uh, but that I got to tell you, it was just too low tech. I left that and went back into aerospace at a company called Sunstream. I made now it's Honeywell. I made the black boxes, but when I was working professionally. The U.S. produced both the Chevy Vega and the Ford Pinto. <laughs> Took solar panels off the roof of the White House and abandoned, officially abandoned teaching the metric system. And you guys, I was very, very concerned about the future of the U.S. Of course, that's done. No, very concerned about the future of the U.S. And uh, came across this very compelling set of studies that 10 years old, is about as old as you can be to get the so-called lifelong passion for science. And I think it's about as old as you can be to get a lifelong passion for anything. You know, if you talk to a journalist, he or she got excited about storytelling long before they were 10. You know, they love stories, storytelling. And so there's reference earlier to kids' books. That's, that's when you get people when they're under 10 or 10. Well, if it's not 10, it's 12, but ain't 23. And so uh, that's why we aim the Science Guy show at people that age. But it turns out 10 years old is pretty good for a lot of people. <laughs> the difference between a 10 year old and a grown up, as far as their ability to reason, isn't all that difference. It's the experience that's the big difference. So, um, what we want to do, I guess, with Richard, is to advocate for science education as much as we can. And you know, it's very common go to a cocktail party or whatever, oh, you're a science guy, you know I never liked science, I didn't really study this book. If you went to a party, I never really liked the alphabet. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't feel, feel I had to memorize the alphabet. I, was, I mean, we'd all go, that's crazy. And so, uh, I guess we chip away at this, you know, are trying to solve this problem of getting, creating a scientific and literate society. Here in the world's most, Technically sophisticated. Okay, you could argue that it's not. Well, it's the most influential culture, and our technical, the U.S.'s technical and science achievements are extraordinary, and uh, that's because of our science education. And what's happened apparently, still at the top, the people in the U.S. and Canada who are graduated from the first-rate institutions, still are the world leaders, and people come from around the world to go to the extraordinary institutions here in the U.S. and Canada to get educated, and then they go back home often, but uh, or sometimes they want to stay. That's still going great, but getting the regular people who work for a living 
to remain engaged in science is a really difficult problem. So why we have this convention, as I understand it, is to engage as many of us as possible to go out, as Carl Sagan and many others said, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. So go out and tell people how exciting science is and the process of science. But the challenge is fighting that frustration. Mr. Ham, dude, <laughs> sir, really, what are you thinking? You're not thinking. Stop it. And so uh, we got to all be disciplined about interacting with people. And uh, one of the things, boy, you guys, I, I got recognition this earlier, and I'm new to the game. I just finished uh, The Swerve about the nature of this poem, the nature of things, where this guy in 50 BC speculated quite accurately that there are atoms and there's no God, and when you're dead, you're dirt. And isn't that cool that we can understand all that? Uh, and uh, uh, it's really quite an insight. And so we want people to, to get this, this excitement. Yes, we have these huge challenges. Yes, we have these great difficulties to face, but we have the means to deal with it. We have science, we have this process this body of knowledge with, that enables us to recognize these problems. Just think if we had the climate changing like this and we didn't know why, whoa, that would be scary. And it is a scary time, but we have the means to address it. So everybody, let's go out and be in love and tell the world, let's, we can do this. It is not just scientific knowledge that Hillary Clinton's running a pedophile ring onto the pizza parlor. They believe in flat earth. Oh, man. In, um, how can we do something about these extraordinary um, aberrations, yeah. which, are, which seem to be some kind of tribal, they're internet tribes, I think. They're not, yes. they're not local tribes, they're internet tribes. Um, so, you guys, you're, many of the people who spoke today are experts on this. How do we work with social media to combat the misinformation on social media. And I gotta say, as a couple of you brought up, the pandemic really took me off guard. I went to elementary school with a guy who had polio. You do not want polio, people, no. And the reason, when I was a little kid growing up in Washington, D.C., relative humidity, 99%. Fahrenheit, 97 Fahrenheit, 35, 40 Celsius. And we couldn't go swimming because of polio, it was waterborne virus. But then when I was in long about third grade, the polio virus was around. Went and took the sugar cube, cool, don't have polio. How can we have this in the US, in Canada, to a small extent, Western Canada? How can we have this People, this thing where people didn't embrace vaccines. And I gotta tell you- Not just didn't embrace, but active hostility. It's a real yeah. mystery, you guys, but let's fight the fight. Let's stay with it. And, and of course, to the extent that you can, be respectful of the other point of view. And keep in mind that the first time somebody hears astrology is bunk, the first time you point out there's no ghosts, that's, that somebody else got your dead aunt's phone number and they're calling your phone, it's not your dead aunt. The first time you hear that, you reject it. The person rejects it. We just gotta stick with it in disciplined, to the extent possible, patient way. And I strongly believe that we will prevail because you can't, you can't get on a plane and have a successful vacation if you think the world is flat. You're not going to get there. You will, you will get lost. And so we can do this, you guys, but I admit it is a, a deep challenge, Richard, a deep challenge. My problem is I cannot summon up any respect. I mean, oh, that's I... it. I'm right there with you, sir. I mean, I was on stage with, can, did we mention Ken? I was on stage with that guy. Just, <laughs> uh, so they've got... They have saber-toothed tigers running around with 
uh, stegosauruses. He goes, no. A, a saber tooth, a saber tooth tiger. I misspoke. I'm sorry. Saber tooth cat, dude. That was an old slip of the brain there. Uh, uh, they were cats, not tigers. Uh, they, they were not vegetarians. They're, I mean, look at their dentition. <laughs> and just this, uh, on and on and on with this guy. But uh, it's easy to go down what everybody loves to know, rabbit holes. It's really to get distracted. E easy to get distracted. But we got to stay the course. This that I mentioned. This next election is it, everybody. This is if we let this go sideways, uh, it will be if we let the lowercase l liberal democracies die, it will kill us all. This is science is the key to our future. So uh, so let's go. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've had the most inspiring. Thank you. Thank you for this story. This talk about a short and this story is extraordinary. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Together, we can change the world. Let's go. Bill Nye and Richard Dawkins, ladies and gentlemen. One more time for Bill Nye. All right, everyone, that's the day.